All right, good morning. Good morning. I want to ask the question today, are you still searching for purpose in your life? Uh, all people outside the faith in Jesus Christ and many within the faith, I find feeling trapped, discouraged, and hopeless. There's no reason for a child of God, a person who knows the Lord, to feel that way, but, but many do. And there are many, all within the, the or outside the faith, certainly, do or struggle to find purpose and significance in life. When I was in seminary uh, in the early years, I took Hebrew, and one of the assignments that we had later on in the year was to write a translation from the Hebrew of the 23rd Psalm. And that was really one of the most significant uh, events that happened during my seminary years because you weren't allowed to have an English Bible open and you were challenged not to refer to your memory of the King James but to translate, parse each verb, translate each word and write translation from the original. Now the thing about the Hebrew language is it's not as um, exact a language as Greek. Uh, there's some words that have several meanings, kind of like English sometimes. And so it was a fascinating thing because everybody in class was to stand up and read their translation. And what I saw in each one was none of them contradicted each other at all, but they were all a little bit different. Now, King James only people freak out over this. I understand that. You're just going to have to deal with it because we were dealing with the original language. But everybody came up with a little different nuance. And friend, that's one of the things that nailed home for me. God's Word is a living Word. It is quickened by the Holy Spirit in the heart of the believer. And so, we, and I just got, by listening to these different translations, uh, there were about 20 or so in the class, man, it just, the 23rd Psalm came alive to me like never before because I was hearing all these little different nuances. He leads me beside, or he calls me to lie down in green pastures, and the green pasture translates tender green grass. In other words, it's the very best of the best. And so in many ways like that, the 23rd Psalm came alive to me, and my appreciation for Scripture and the biblical languages came alive in a new way for me through <clears throat> that assignment. This morning, I don't have a, we're not in the Galatian study yet, and so I kind of enjoy those Sundays because on those days, uh, just uh, the Lord just kind of takes me where he will. And today, I just want to talk about two of my very favorite verses of Scripture. And more than preach, I just want to study those with you this morning. And that would be Hebrews 12, verses 1 and 2. And I'm going to read it in both the King James Version and the New King James because each picks up some of those nuances I'm talking about. Wherefore, seeing we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now, New King James. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down on the right hand of the throne of God. Somebody asked about my hand a while ago, and the horse whisperer, I am not. Uh, we, there was no grass in the, in, in the area where the horse stays, and I felt like she needed to graze a little bit, and so uh, keep giving her too much rain, uh, I was leading her out, and she kept trying to stop and graze on the path that was going out to the path. There's very little grass there, but there's none where she was, so she kept trying to stop. And I thought, you know, we're a lot like that. 
When God tries to lead us to the best, we want to short circuit and disobey and, get, and settle for something less. And I thought, you know, Belle, I'm not going to let you stay here. There's better grass out here. Come on, Belle. And she didn't like that. She snorted, bucked, and turned and kicked me in the hand. Um, I was trying to teach her a biblical concept. She taught me one when she caused me to lie down in green pastures. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we live and we learn. But uh, anyway, it's broken, but it's healing nicely, and uh, I'll be okay. But just, uh, you know, Marty obviously needs to pamper me for the next few weeks. And wait on me. But, uh, Maybe. She's taking good care of me. But as I read these verses this morning, there's several nuances, and uh, King James says we're compass about so great a cloud of witnesses, and the uh, New King James says surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. Well, let me tell you, there's a nuance in that, that word witnesses, because it can be translated in different ways. One is those who are around you watching. Folks, I want to tell you, the lost world is watching us, and you are the only Bible some people will ever read. And what you do does matter. The attitude you show does matter. Whether or not you bear spiritual fruit as you claim the name of Christian out in the world really matters because that's what the world is looking for and needs, and that's what draws them to Christ. And so the word witnesses should actually challenge us in how we behave and how we carry ourselves and what attitude we have when we leave the house in the morning. How many families over the years driving to church and they, you know, they're yelling at the kids and fussing and fighting and then they open the door and get out of the church parking lot and say, good morning, brother. And you can tell it's plastered on, putting on their game face. I want to tell you, that's not what we need to be doing. We need to have the Holy Spirit shining within us, bearing fruit of love, joy, peace, patience, tenderness, and all those things for the world to see and partake of in us and leads them to faith in Jesus Christ. But there's another nuance there. That word for witnesses can also be translated those who've gone before us. Friend, that should infuse you with encouragement. Those saints who set an example for you, poured their lives into you, and have gone on to be with Jesus. <laughs> Folks, I believe today they're cheering us on. I can't prove with Scripture that they're watching, but there are some indications of it, and I believe they're cheering us on. On the Sunday uh, after my dad's death, he died on a Friday night, I preached that Sunday morning, but the next Sunday I was back home, and the special music that day at First Baptist Hendersonville was that, that song, uh, I Can Only Imagine by Mercy Me. And I can tell you that as that song began to play, I can only imagine what it will be. I can envision my death, meeting some of the men who had mentored me in ministry. And I can see them and other men who had poured their lives into me in the past who had gone on as well. And I could envision them talking and fellowshipping and looking and cheering me on. And I knew they were proud of me. And I can tell you, it gave me encouragement to press on. Folks, I believe those who went on can see. I believe we are compassed about with a cloud of witnesses, of believers who have lived faithfully, who have gone to be with Christ. And they may, you know, somebody said once they didn't believe that they could see what's on earth because there's suffering and bad things going on. But I'll tell you what. To them, they can look down and see, yeah, you're suffering right now, but boy, just hang on. In just a few minutes, you're going to be here with us. In the blink of an eye, you're going to be here with us. Hang on. And they're cheering us on. So we're compassed about with cloud of witnesses. We should be challenged about our witness by those who are observing us. We should be encouraged by those who've gone on before us. Therefore, let us lay aside every weight. That weight is that unnecessary baggage that we carry. Those idle, those misplaced priorities that draw our focus away from Christ. You know, that's all Satan wants to do. He doesn't care if, uh, if you get very close to the truth as long as you miss it just a little bit. 
2 Timothy 1.7 says, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and of a sound mind. Those fears that cripple you, those phobic fears that, that get in your way of following Christ. Well, I don't want to witness. I might make a fool of myself. Oh, I might scare somebody off, so I won't witness. Well, where are you going to scare them to? Hell number two? I mean, beloved, let's overcome those fears. Let's lay those things aside because God didn't give them to you. The only fear that's of God is the fear of God. Other fears, the evil one tries to use fear to bind us up, to cripple us. So lay aside those things. And the sin that so easily besets us. That word for sin, basically missing the mark. And folks, what he's talking about laying aside is things where you know you're deliberately missing the mark. Lay those things aside. Because that cuts off your spiritual power source. And as you face this new year, you say, well, I've got this little pet sin over here that I'm going to keep to myself. I'm going to tell you, friend, it's cutting you off from your power source. Mm -hmm. you, know, you, you know, sometimes your lights go out at home, and sometimes they're on. But you know what does real damage? A brownout. When the voltage drops and your lights run dim, and that can do real damage to your electronics. And I want to tell you, folks, that's what some people are trying to live their spiritual life in, is a, a condition of spiritual brownout. In other words, they are not really plugged in. They're trying to keep one foot in the world and one foot in the kingdom. And it's robbing them of their strength. They can't op operate in the fullness of the power of the Holy Spirit of God, and it robs them of victory. Lay aside every weight and the sin. Jesus said in John 5, 15, 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abides in me and I in him, the same bears much fruit. Say this with me. For without me, you can do what? Nothing. Nothing. <coughs> Beloved, we may think we want to do it ourselves and so many times. I don't know why. <laughs> yeah, I kind of do, I guess. But in my younger Christian life, every time I was in an Easter pageant or Easter festival and they did recreated either the visiting of the tomb or the Last Supper, they always made me Simon Peter. The thing I learned about Simon Peter, if you study his life, is, boy, he had a zeal for God, he had a faith in God, but he would often run, often run ahead of God. He would get fired up and then go out in his own strength and power. Like when he stepped out of the boat and he... Boy, God was supporting him, but then he got his eyes off of Jesus onto the waves and began to sink. He got himself in trouble a lot. So I don't know why they always made me sign in here. But, um, but if we abide in Christ, if you're having your daily quiet time, if you're getting prayed up before you face the day, putting your spiritual armor on to go out and face the world, you can bear much fruit. You can walk in his power. Missionary Frank Labac, uh, when he was about 45, he said, I intend to make the rest of my life an experiment of being constantly in a state of prayer. He took pray without ceasing. That verse, he took it literally, and he said, I want to stay in a state of prayer all the time. He said, and he wrote a book about it, and he said, at first, what well, was difficult for more than a few minutes. You know, I mean, when I had my quiet time, yeah, I could focus. But then when I'd get out in the world, it'd just be in a, I'd be focusing on the Lord. And then the first little thing would divert my attention. And I could only do it a few minutes. Eventually, it built up to about 15 minutes. And eventually, he was doing hours. When he was just going through his life and yet walking in the power of the Holy Spirit, totally focused. And you know, he said, I have learned that it's hard work to stay focused but when I do, nothing else is. Everything else seems to fall into place. He said, and people I meet, it just seems like they want to come with me. And what it was, he was bearing spiritual fruit. He had laid aside the weight and the sin and was abiding in Christ. And it was a shining light. You know, he wrote some 40 books in the rest of his life, developed an education system that's still being used all around the world on the mission field. God used him mightily because he abided in Christ. He laid aside the weight and the sin and looked unto Jesus. 
verses looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Folks, our theme is all about Jesus. One person knew that. No, that more knew. Our theme is all about Jesus. All about Jesus. Folks, he is the example of our life. And we're being told in Hebrews here to um, lay aside the things that distract us and look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. His life is our example. I love that verse in Amazing Grace. Tis grace that brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. The author and finisher of our faith. Hebrews 14, 15, I, I encounter people sometimes who, man, just, I don't know what, they're angry at God. They've had a death in the family or they've had something, circumstances befall them, a uh, bitter divorce, something, and they're angry at God. And I'm going to tell you, he understands exactly where you are. He understands exactly what you're going through. He understands exactly the things that trip you up. You may think, well, nobody knows what I'm going through. I'm going to tell you, he does, and he understands it. Hebrews 14, 15 says, We do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. He understood temptation, but he never missed the mark. So many times our missing the mark is what causes some of our circumstances, amen? Not all, but many so we're called to abide in Him and keep our focus on Christ. And I would urge you, beloved, in 2016, make that your goal. Because walking in Him and abiding in Him is the purpose of a believer. You want purpose in your life? You want a sense of significance in your life? Make being a shining light for Him. Make staying focused on Him. Make glorifying Him your passion your purpose, your goal, and you will find you have real, significant purpose. Hebrews 11, 6 says, Without faith, it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is, that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Now, I was talking to Charles about it the other day. There's a lot of heresy being preached right now, and they're drawing multitudes of people into it because it's basically a promise of wealth. If you give money, uh, you're going to God guarantees you a hundredfold. And they're twisting and proof texting scripture to develop a heretical teaching. We call it health and wealth. And I can tell you that a lot of people are getting very rich with that kind of preaching. And it's no different than. Uh, lottery playing out, you know, they, they broadcast and advertise every lottery winner to try to bait you into it. And these guys, they may show some success story and say, looky here, looky here. What they don't show you is how many losers they are. I knew somebody who attended one of those churches once and they'd been giving 30% of their income to that church. And suddenly when the man lost his job and they fell on some hard times, they couldn't pay their bills. They went to the church for help. Pastor had a private jet, big estate, and all this stuff. Just one of these health and wealth guys. They went to the church. You know what their response was? If you had enough faith, you wouldn't be in this position. I want to tell you, friend, there are lots of people who are spirit-filled, walking with Christ, and they suffer every single day. God's faithful and he'll walk through the fire with you, but he does not promise you won't walk through fire and that you won't work through, walk through difficulty. You know, that kind of preaching is not popular these days. People want to find easy streets. Well, I'm going to tell you, easy streets are streets of gold when we get there. But until then, we need his source of his strength. And you can have purpose and significance as you abide in him, focus on him, and walk in him. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. He didn't like all that stuff either. But he's now set down on the right hand of the throne of God. You see, there are people, you know, boy, I just cringe when I hear, well, the Bible says everything's good. No, it doesn't. It says, 
God can bring good out of everything. Sometimes you're just plain bad. Yeah. You know, and, and God can bring good out of it. But Jesus, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross. Yeah. Dear friend, the point there is, with Christ as our example, there's joy set before us who follow Christ, and that's the finish line when we're in perfect health, no more suffering, no more crying, no more pain, and life joyous forever. That's the joy that's set before us. That's our purpose. That's our goal. That's why we believe in missions and making disciples. That's why it's all about Jesus. Because the joy is set before us, and for that reason we should endure the race that we're running. Let what motivated him motivate you. And let his purpose be your purpose. Now, he's the Savior. You can't be a Savior. You can't save anybody, but friend, you can sure reflect the Savior and point them towards him. Romans 8, 28, in closing, says, We know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Many folks in this room and, and, and close to my age group remember the great basketball legend, Pete Maravich, known as Pistol Pete. He set a lot of records that have not been broken to this date, scoring records, and yet he did not have a three-point line. So, I mean, he was an amazing basketball player. And after he retired, depression set in, got into alcohol. You see what happened? He was drawing all his significance from his athletic ability. And when that was gone, he had no purpose. He had no hope. But someone shared with him the good news of Jesus Christ. And he came to faith in Christ. And he began to be a shining witness. He discovered a new purpose in his life, a real purpose in his life, the Savior. And he was going to serve the Savior for the joy that set before him. And he was going, just some years after his basketball uh, uh, career was over, but he was still well known, still well known today. But he was invited to be a, a, a guest on Focus on the Family, James Dobson's national radio program. And Dr. Dobson back in that day was a bit younger, and he loved basketball. And he said, probably wasn't the most humble thing I ever did. I invited Pete Mar Maravich to play basketball with me uh, at the gym that morning. He said, imagine me challenging him to a game of one-on-one. -on -one. But they met at the gym with some other guys, and they were playing basketball and having a good time, and suddenly Maravich collapsed. And Dr. Dobson ran over and cradled his head and said, Pete, Pete, but it was already gone. A defect in his heart from birth that was never found, no one ever knew was there, took him. Suddenly, Dr. Dobson said, as I held his head and mourned his loss, his passing, I couldn't help notice the t-shirt that he had on, that said, looking unto Jesus. See, in some ways, he was a winner in the world's eyes, but in reality was a loser, spiritually speaking. But friend, he ended a great winner. Most victorious. Let what motivated him, let what motivated Jesus motivate you in this new year. That's our goal. That's our purpose. <coughs> that you, let that be our passion in every area of life. And you will never again feel trapped. You will never again feel discouraged, at least not in the long haul. I know emotionally we can always get down a little bit, but you will never live in a state of discouragement because you have a purpose, and God is at work in it. And even through bad circumstances, will bring good that will point to him. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Let's pray. Father.
we praise you and thank you that you are on the throne. We thank you, Father, that you have provided a way to have eternal life. Lord Jesus, you came out of glory and lived among us a sinless life and suffered and died for us and ascended back to the Father. Lord, let this be the day when some who don't know you as Savior and Lord receive you. Let this be the day when some who know you as Savior and Lord but have been distracted lay aside those weights and the sin that so easily ensnares us and reset their focus on you that they may have victory in 2016. We ask in Jesus' name and God's people said, Amen. Amen.